Good morning and good evening, everyone. I am Nazia Zaidi, Product Manager of AVDF. Uh, thank you for joining uh, today and uh, a very warm, warm welcome to AVDF Cafe. Uh, today, it's a very first session of AVDF series. Uh, AVDF Cafe series will be a quarterly series. Every quarter, uh, we will be talking about some new topic, uh, uh, whether it's a use case or it's a, it's an architecture or it is a best practices and many more exciting uh, topics we will be talking about it. Uh, during this session, if you have any query, we have a development managers of AVDF joined with us. They can take up your queries. You can, you can post your questions on Q&A uh, window and they will help you to answer. I encourage uh, ask as many questions as you want, and hopefully you will get appropriate answers for that. We won't be monitoring chat window, so I request you do not send um, your questions on chat window, rather send it on Q&A. In middle of the session, we will have polls. Uh, this poll has a five question and I will run for 30 seconds. I request you all to participate in that poll and give your feedback. Today with me, Angeline Dhanarani, she is product manager for database audit and data safe audit. We both will be covering top five ways to get 2x value out of your database activity monitoring solution, that is AVDF. Today, our agenda is very simple. First, we will talk about key drivers, and then we will talk about what the expert says, what are those top five requirements from database activity monitoring or auditing solution. And finally, we will talk about top five AVDF use cases uh, where, you know, that's those use cases are over and above those generic um, AVDF or any database activity monitoring uh, solution use cases, uh, because our focus is how you can get 2x value out of it. So we want to talk about um, uh, some, some special specialized use cases with you that you should um, configure in your environment, whether you are existing user, you are partner, or someone just trying to run, learn AVDF. Okay, so what is the problem statement here? Uh, why we are looking for database activity monitoring solution? Why organizations are implementing such solutions? Okay, so there are very uh, there are many questions which comes in mind, and we try to look for answer of those questions. For example, what your privileged users and DBAs are doing. How do you block when any unauthorized access happens to your database? How, how you receive your alerts when any suspicious activity occurs or how quickly you can identify uh, what exactly happened on your system? How quickly you can do the forensic on your system? And finally, how do you comply with the regulatory requirement, whether it is, uh, it is global or it is local? So these are the questions that uh, uh, we look for and we look for our, from our database activity monitoring uh, solution. Hackers are interested in your data. They can use many actors, like they can come directly to the database through application, or they can even use trusted user to attack your database. That is the reason access to your critical or sensitive data should be monitored, but at the same time, strongly controlled. Oracle has always believed in the philosophy of trust, but verify. So we let our users do whatever they want, but at the same time, we monitor and verify what exactly they are doing. That's why we always segregate three section or a three pillar when it comes to uh, you know, accessing of your sensitive data or or your sensitive databases that monitor, detect, and protect. Let's take what our experts or different analysts say. What are those top five, um, I would say, categories or areas they ask you to focus that you should monitor or 
protect or detect from uh, database activity monitoring solutions. So the five major criteria, I would say, they would like you to monitor, detect, and protect is to access to detect uh, deletion or any changes to your sensitive data from any privileged users, which means you should have full visibility of what your privileged users are doing on your sensitive data. The second important one, which is more, more important from the regulatory compliance perspective, that what value of data has been changed, how data is being changed, whether it's being changed from the right um, channels, right user or not, how, how your user entitlement being changed. Uh, today's where many, many attacks like, um, like zero trust or ransomware, et cetera, uh, where user privileges has been misused or escalated. Okay, so changes in user entitlement and monitoring of those or auditing of those entitlement is very important. And that is one, uh, one area of database auditing that you should focus on. The third and the important one is about the data exfiltration, right? Uh, different users are getting access to excessive amount of data that they are not supposed to get data or they are, they are not needed it for the legitimate work. Um, the fourth pillar, I would say, or a fourth category, when access to your sensitive data is happening through inappropriate or non-approved channels. For example, I'm trying to have, if, if you look at a use case, almost never your DBA needs to see uh, application data, right? Uh, so such kind of a uh, you know, monitoring, protection, as well as detection, you need to have. Access to unauthorized data or SQLs. That's the final use case. Like as there are unknown SQLs which should which should not be running on your databases or through your application. Uh, your application there are not known to your application. So you monitor that, detect that, and protect such kind of a unauthorized SQLs or a unknown SQLs running on your databases. So these are the five categories that majority of analysts and experts suggest that all these categories you should monitor, detect, and as well as protect. Now let's look at what are those top five ways that you can get 2x value out of your AVDF? Uh, I'll just give you a little bit brief or an overview of AVDF because we might have a many audience which are very new to AVDF. So uh, Oracle Audit Vault and Database Firewall is a very powerful database activity monitoring solution to protect and monitor your sensitive data. We provide uh, best of both the worlds, which combines your native auditing along with the network-based SQL traffic capture so that you can have view from the both sides. Uh, AVDF provides key value or you get answers to the question that we have raised before by these three major categories, which is like you monitor your privileged user activity. That's, that's the capability AVDF provides you. Then quickly you can understand if, that what happened after an incident. AVDF provides a very rich uh, reporting, analytics, and alerting engine through which you can have a very sophisticated forensic that what exactly happened on your system. And you can identify uh, that particular incident in very less amount of time. Then the third one, you block or you protect any or prevent any unauthorized access to your sensitive data or, or through unknown or uh, unprivileged users trying to access that data. You get alerted, notified on any suspicious activity happening on your system. And finally, uh, it provides you a very simplified regulatory compliance, whether these are the global uh, regulatory compliance like GDPR or uh, 
or Sarbanes Oxley or PCI, or maybe the local ones, let's say for India, RBI or a Singapore regulatory and many more, right? So every country like Singapore, Korea, Hong Kong, you all have your country specific, India country specific regulatory compliance. And AVDF gives you that, that strength, that power that you can modify those, uh, uh, mon uh, modify those reports as per your regulatory requirements so that you are not spending a lot of time in getting those data for your auditor. The beauty of AVDF is that we say that it's, it's, it's a protection um, solution, right? It provides a data security to your data, but how about how secure AVDF itself? So AVDF provides a very strong tamper pool proof repository, uh, repository. Uh, you, AVDF itself has and uses, runs on enterprise edition of Oracle database that you use to run your enterprise applications like core banking or your major telecom applications, etc. And it uses all those enterprise level of security solutions like database world or TD or in memory, etc. partitioning. To, to provide you a very effective, efficient, and protected repository for your most critical auditing data. You can integrate with, the, with internal tools like DB, SAT, et cetera, for sensitive data discovery, or, uh, or you can integrate with third-party solutions like SIM and other solutions. So in nutshell, AVDF is a comprehensive, complete solution, powerful solution, to give you database activity monitoring. Like I said, um, with, the, with database auditing, along with network-based monitoring, AVDF provides a comprehensive database activity monitoring solution to you and provides best of both the words. I know that there, there are solutions, they are just focusing on the network-based monitoring. But if you look at from the regulation perspective, your database auditing is the guaranteed audit trail. And you need to provide that data. And AVDF gives you flexibility to use that. You can you have a combination of database um, auditing along with network auditing, or you can just use uh, one of them, but using combination of both will give you best of both the words. Um, for example, st stored procedure monitoring. Anything happened through a stored procedure, you cannot monitor from anything uh, which is capturing through, which is, which is monitoring network-based SQLs. But database auditing can give you that flexibility. However, network-based monitoring will more focus and give you capability to protect or detect any kind of a SQL injection attempt or any unauthorized activity happening on your system, not running on your database. So, so from the performance perspective, it's, it's, it's completely, you know, negligible impact on your system, etc. So they both has, um, have their own strength and together they give you a very powerful database activity monitoring solution. So these are the top five AVDF use cases. Um, this is this is beyond what we talked about in overview, right? Uh, monitoring privileged users or uh, generating alert on suspicious activity or having simplified regulatory compliance, et cetera. Uh, we feel that our most of the users use those standard categories. If they have database uh, activity monitoring solution, they are definitely using that for, for these purpose, okay? But there are some important use cases which we feel that you should be using it. And these are being suggested uh, with analysts and experts that we discussed in previous slide as well. A very first one that AVDF provides a very strong data privacy report. Through this data privacy report, you can really have a clear visibility of your sensitive objects who is accessing that, who has privilege to those objects, how that object being used or accessed by whom, okay? So you have a very 
complete view by particular uh, by by these data privacy reports uh, this is very interesting um, use case uh, many of you might not be using it um, so today angeline will talk about it explain it later on about this particular use case the second use case, like I said, when you mainly need most of the time for, for before and after values, uh, mainly for auditing purpose, that how that data has been changed and where this data has been changed and changes in your user entitlement. The, this is the, again, second very important use case. And these two will be covered by um, Anjali. Uh, she will be talking about that, explaining it, and, and doing a product demo for you. The third one, it's data exfiltration. So through AVDF, you can detect any attempt uh, if somebody is trying to access more than number of data or more than records what what they are supposed to do it which is uh, let's say suddenly i'm i'm a dba and generally my work is just to just to access uh, a couple of records maybe if if at all i'm running select query or or let's say it operation guy or somebody else and suddenly one day i'm i'm trying to access thousands of records of customer let's say a call center user so this kind of a data exfiltration attempts and how you should protect, monitor, you should detect is, is you can achieve through database firewall. And I will talk about that particular use case. The very important other use case is that uh, trusted path to your application. Your application is being accessed by many means. They are coming through application users are coming through application server, and might be there are other other ways that your applications application data can be accessed. You need to create a trusted path that these are. This is the channel which is a trusted channel or a trusted path for my application. Anything above and beyond that, I want to um, get alerted or I want to get it blocked. So that's the fourth use case that uh, we will be talking about it. And, and our final use case, which is uh, basically uh, monitoring and analyzing SQL traffic uh, of the database and prevent SQL injection attempts now, by analyzing those SQLs. Okay, there are applications being written uh, which 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 are prone to SQL injection. So so sometimes we do have certain applications which uh, which has that vulnerability and which are prone to SQL in injections. How you can prevent um, such kind of SQL injection uh, by database firewall itself, uh, like Oracle policy always had been that you 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 have your security layer very close to the database. So even if something missed at the application layer or bad code by application, database should be able to detect and prevent such kind of a attack. With this, I will hand over uh, to Angeline to cover first two use cases. Um, yeah, no, Angeline, no, 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 I'll no, stop no, no. sharing. I hope it can be seen now. Yeah, we can see. Okay, so the first use case was about um, monitoring the sensitive data access. Prior to going to the use cases, like these are some of the instruments that you would be using to construct those flows. So let me talk about how do you actually build these use cases. So one aspect is, uh, as Nazia was mentioning, like, you know, you need to have both the database auditing and network monitoring put together. And um, the database auditing helps you build those audit policies and audit configurations in a manner that helps track these sensitive data access. And of course, Nazia will be taking in a minute through how you can structure the network policies in a way that you can track all the access. Now, coming to the database audit portion of it, Nazia will talk about how to configure the network monitoring. <clears throat> first, <clears throat> I'm sorry about it. Uh, so the first thing when you plan a doing the database auditing is the three things that you need to consider is what exactly you need to audit. And there was a question in the uh, Q&A panel, like how do you uh, structure the AVDF in a way that there is a minimal performance impact? So much of that goes into how you're structuring these policies, whether it is audit policies, 
or whether it's a network monitoring policy, which is a firewall policy, you have to structure them in a way that it's more focused to the actions that you really want to monitor. So the first important point is, what exactly do you want to audit? The second is, how do you provision these audit policies that uh, it can track and uh, monitor what it needs to? Third is, how do you size the AVDF for the volume? Now, as you're already aware, and many of you, um, okay, I've gone past that stage. Let me go back to this. Okay, I'm sorry about it. So, uh, as you're already aware, Audit Vault Server collects the audit data from the database and other sources. And uh, from the database, it can take on going so fast. Okay, from the database, it can actually read from table trail, directory trail, or redo a transactions log. And of course, there are other uh, sources like file systems or directory services that it can read the redo log, uh, all these logs. And it takes those audit. Um, there is agent component which reads these log file and it inserts to the audit vault server in near real time. And then you would see that in the audit vault console. This is, a, this is a gist of what happens within the audit vault component. Now coming to how do you structure these flows, the first thing that you need to ensure is what to audit. Now, as a best practice, create the audit policies. Now these are artifacts that you create in the database, whether it's Oracle or non-Oracle. Oracle, we provide the best practice recommendation. For non-Oracle, please consult the respective vendors of the database. Uh, for Oracle database, we, we have golden principles around how you can create effective audit policies. One is around monitoring the privileged user activity, where, uh, as you're aware, privileged users are soft targets. And uh, because they have uh, wide system access, so stolen credentials or, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, pseudoing to one of these privileged users is one of the common hacking attempts that is, uh, uh, that's there in the industry. So monitoring the, the privileged user activity, whether it's uh, uh, user accounts with administrative access, or you have given some of the user accounts direct access to the database, or there are some high risk uh, user accounts who have access because you have uh, allowed them to run ad hoc queries on the database. So such privileged users, their activity need to be monitored. And uh, uh, second aspect is around the security relevant event auditing. So there are some activities in the database, like, you know, alter system or any kind of schema modification changes or security policy changes, like any changes in the audit policy configurations or changes to the, say, for example, if you're using RAS, VPD or any of these uh, TSTP policies. So any of the changes to the security policy uh, changes happening within the database, those needs to be audited. Uh, so we recommend auditing those kind of uh, database security events. Third aspect is around the sensitive data access auditing. So sensitive data is like a crown jewel that, that's there within your database and any uh, hacker is behind your data. So we recommend auditing any access to the sensitive data and it can be fine tuned like anything. Uh, if there is an application service account, that's kind of a, it's an expected pattern which comes from a, a, a business flow. So you can exclude the trusted path when you build these uh, audit configurations. Or if you want to uh, monitor access to certain columns within the database table, that's also possible within the fine-grained access uh, auditing policies. So you have to make these audit policies in a very granular way to monitor just what you want in the database. And this is actually, it's not a guesswork that we're doing. We have, a, um, if I can show you, there is a unified audit best practice white paper. Okay, so this best practice white paper on the unified audit policies that's there on our OTN, you can take a look and we have provided the recommendation on how you can structure the policies around these principles for Oracle database. 
and each of them has details on how you can like um, how you can know your privileged users or how you can identify the sensitive data landscape using the dbsat report and how you can structure the policies so take a look at it uh, this is one of the uh, principles that we we regularly recommend uh, all our uh, customers and prospects to you know start configuring the audit policies taking into account what what is more relevant for auditing the second principle around uh, the database audit planning is how do you provision these audit policies once you know what to audit in the database? There are golden principles around it. The first is Oracle database always has something called as mandatory audit policies, which we don't, uh, uh, which we cannot turn it off. It's it's there by default because we believe in the principle of secure by default for certain important things that's happening within the database. So any Armin configurations or database vault configurations or any of the audit policy changes that's happening on the metadata, that's all mandatorily audited by default in Oracle database. And uh, with cloud flavors like autonomous, you have additional mandatory audit options which are provided by the cloud flavors as such so leverage these mandatory audit options and uh, and these are well published in our db security guide and you'll also find them referenced to the uh, in the audit white paper uh, so check that out don't create audit policies if if your need is satisfied with those mandatory audit configurations because it's anyway there by default you don't have to create one that's duplicating the what's already defined second is leverage the predefined audit policies now predefined audit policies come in two categories uh, one is the oracle predefined policies oracle database itself offers a number of predefined policies these are like pre-designed best practice uh, for specific needs and you can actually enable them based on your requirements for example like uh, if you want to track any kind of account management changes, that's there uh, as a policy. If you want to uh, track database parameter changes, that's available. If you if you have database vault enabled and you want to say you want to track the realm violations, that's that's also there. You just need to turn it on. The second category is what's offered by the AVDF from the console. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the recommended policies, for example, the critical database activity or any of the schema changes or uh, tracking the privileged user activity. All these are offered by AVDF. All it needs is a single click provisioning option right from the uh, console. Now, the third principle is now once you leverage the mandatory, once you leverage the predefined, which is there, with for you with a single click the third category is when you have when you start creating the custom audit policies and these are typical to your unique scenarios for example what might be sensitive in one region might not be sensitive in a different region so typically sensitive data access audit is one scenario where you might want to create custom audit policies in your database so uh, use a dbsat or the data safe cloud service to identify what the sensitive data are in your environment and you can actually define those categories if you don't uh, because we publish a certain set of sensitive categories by default which is available within these tools and that's around 125 plus so mostly it should be satisfied but if you want to define your own sensitive category these tools does provide you that option and once uh, you run this and you have a sense of what the sensitive data is you can create these audit policies now AVDF does have a flexibility to retrieve the audit policies once it's provided, once it's there in the uh, database, and you have the option to enable or disable them from the console. So that's the second one. So first one was what to audit, how do you provision these audit policies, and third is how do you size the AVDF to get these audit volumes. Now, we do provide a MOS note out there, which is uh, which is uh, available publicly. So everybody can take a look at it. And this actually helps. It's like an advisory way where you feed in how many targets you want to monitor, how, how is the audit volume 
input, the audit generation rate within these uh, targets. And you, there are different categories, like whether the target is expected to generate a lot of audit volumes or whether it's like a medium or high, or you can also add custom ones if you think it doesn't match one of our pre-designed uh, uh, numbers. And uh, the output in the same spreadsheet will give you how much your audit vault a server should be sized to take this input because at the end of it all these sources of audit records which are in your database it gets pulled in from by the agent by the audit vault agent into the audit vault server an audit vault server is a secure data warehouse where you can define like you know you need to store audit data online for so and so many months and uh, uh, in the archive for so and so many months so audit vault server configuration is an important component that you need to plan ahead uh, based on how much of audit the uh, volume you expect those database targets to provide and this gives you like uh, it's not a manual calculation it's like it's we have the predefined formula behind the scene which will output to you how much your uh, cpu ram or the storage size should be similarly for the audit vault agent as well like uh, uh, there are like if you are hosting that on the database servers um, you need to allocate additional resources, or if you have it on a remote box, you have to provide appropriate resource in that box for the agent to be functional. And of course, we have uh, scalability, good scalability numbers, like single audit wall server can support up to 1000 targets, a single agent can support up to 20 audit trails. And uh, the current, uh, the audit wall server, the 20.6 uh, is the latest, we have uh, the throughput rate of 1000 records per second per co. Now, once you have designed the audit policy configuration, you have provisioned the data, uh, the, the uh, audit uh, policies. Now, the next one, this is where you start beginning to design these uh, use cases. One of the first use cases is the data privacy. Um, reports. Now, as Nazia was telling, this is one of the cool feature where you start tracking the sensitive data access. And how do you do that in the um, AVDF is what is depicted here. The first is the once you have the DBSAT report, and I'll show you in a while, I don't know like if everybody has seen the DBSAT report. Now, this is a DBSAT report, um, uh, which, which is used in this flow, or in this demo flow, where it gives you granular detail of which schema, which table, what column, and how many uh, rows have the sensitive data in them. So uh, once you run that, you get this form of a report. Or you can also use, uh, who are familiar with Enterprise Manager, you can use Enterprise Manager application data model that will also give you an XML kind of an input. Now, both these uh, uh, are uh, you can uh, any of these can be imported within the um, AVDF, and what it does is now AVDF knows the metadata of what which is your sensitive uh, column, which is your sensitive table, what how many rows it contains, which is sensitive. So once you give that metadata to AVDF, then uh, all the data privacy reports, which I'll show you in a minute, gives you information. If there are any activities that happen on those sensitive tables, those are presented in the form of the reports. Like uh, this is a sensitive data report, and these are the activities that happen on the sensitive data. But but ensure like if you need to get data in these reports, first is the sensitive data, sensitive metadata, which you would import into AVDF. And of course, the audit policies that track the activities that happen on the sensitive data. These needs to go together. If you don't have the audit configurations or later, Nazia will be talking about the network monitoring also. So if you don't have these policies configured, you will not have activities that's captured on these sensitive data reports. Now, let me show you on the demo. So as an admin, if you go to targets and if you drill down, I'm sure most of you are familiar. So this is a new look and feel with AVDF 20. 
and this a lot uh, simpler uh, user-friendly UI. Uh, so with the targets, you get the sensitive objects. This is where you would import the metadata, which is from the DBSAT or enterprise application data model. Now, once you have imported it, now as an auditor, if you go to reports, go to compliance reports and uh, <clears throat> so this is a sensitive uh, metadata that's uh, that's imported from the um, from whatever you supply as form of the dbsat report and if you want to track the activities that's happening so this is where So this is all the activities that's happening on the demo HR employees. And these are the sensitive columns. And this comes because there is an audit configuration that uh, tracks access to this particular table. So, um, so your sensitive metadata uh, and your audit policies needs to go hand in hand. Or whether if you're doing the network policies, your firewall policies, also there is a way to configure saying like, this is my sensitive object, which you want to track access, what kind of uh, activities you want to track on this object that's also definable within the network policies. So the policies and the metadata needs to go hand in hand for powering the data privacy report. Now the next use case, is the before after value changes. And this is a prominent use case as Nazia was mentioning because many of the compliance regulations ask for it. Now the audit gives you what has changed, what had uh, its post that particular transaction. So what, uh, what is the latest value post that change is what you get from the audit. And of course, a, a lot of other information like who did that change, when it happened, which client session that did that, all those contextual information is there with audit. But what you would get from a redo log is the fact that what has been changed, how it has, how the data has changed, what has been the value before and what has been the latest value. So that's the before after value change, which comes from the redo logs. And uh, we, uh, in ABDF, we use Oracle Golden Gate to get the information from the redo log using the Golden Gate integrated extract process that you would configure, which would provide that information in the in a form which is consumable by the audit vault agents and it can be reported by the audit vault server. So a prominent thing to note is the Oracle Golden Gate integration and Oracle Golden Gate is in 20, AVDF 20 is available as a restricted use license. So it's not a separate licensable component. So it is available for the purpose of building the integration extract for the uh, for uh, uh, AVDF, this is available as a restricted use license. And now, once um, once this information is available in Audit Vault Server, all you need to do for people who are familiar with it in 12.2, we used to have a transaction log audit trail, uh, and then you can get those data within uh, the AVDF. Uh, it powers the data modification before after values. Let me just show you in the demo. So this is the uh, Golden Gate server. So once you're on the Golden Gate server, you can configure the integrated extract and how I wouldn't add that because I have it, but let me show you. So there are three options here. So you have to configure the integrated extract. Now I've already have one configured here. I can show you that. So once you configured for the particular database, of course, you have to create a user granted access to run this process. So that has to be done as a prerequisite. Once it's done in the integrated process, you give the particular uh, database that you want to monitor the transaction, the changes in the before after. 
and then you provide the details. There was a question in the chat, like how do you, what kind of data you get? So anything that is exposed by the Golden Gate, for example, here I have included all the DML activities that's happening on a particular schema. Or you can be very specific to say, this is a table on uh, which I want to monitor the DML operations or DDL operations. So I can be very specific and I can be more uh, broader as well. And these are provided by the Golden Gate. So whatever is supported by the Golden Gate operations, it is exposed and we do support. The only requirement from the AVDF has been this particular format, which uh, helps formulate the XML output in a way that is consumable by audit vault agents. Now, once this is configured and the extract process is running, uh, if you come to the audit vault server, now in the targets, I have the transaction log audit trail, which picks up the XML from this location. Uh, this, as you see here, it's alongside the unified audit trail. So unified audit trail is the one which brings the audit. And this one, the transaction log brings me the redo log information. So once this is available, it starts collecting. If you go to reports and data modification before after values, you would see all the data. You would see the data, what, what has changed, what, what had caused the change to that particular uh, table or the schema, and what exactly is the change, the old value and the new value. Um, if you see here, there is one update that has gone in and that's been captured. So this is a cool way of tracking some of the uh, sensitive column data changes. So if you if you're concerned like whether there are something that's happening on the credit card transactions and what has changed, what uh, value was it before or after? This is one way you can um, you know monitor it quite closely. So that's one thing. And the other changes that you might want to monitor is the privileged user entitlements. Now changes to the user entitlements are quite critical, and the way that you do it is in the target. Um, if you drill down, there is a section where you can say like, you know, you want to bring over the user entitlements for the target to the ABDF. And this is the place where you will say, uh, you can schedule it. Like, so if you want to run it like every day, I have a scheduled uh, job which says, bring me the user entitlements that's happening uh, every day. Or if you, the same applies for audit policy and stored procedure auditing also. So if you want to track the changes that's happening in the audit policy, yes, we do get the latest. And if you want to track what's happening within the database, like if there are attempts to modify something, some of the definitions of packages or functions which in, within the database that AVDS does offer. But uh, today we won't be demoing this particular piece, but I'm just uh, want to let you know, this is one of the key differentiated use cases that we have to track entitlement changes or uh, stored procedure auditing changes. So once you retrieve the user entitlements, you have a way to say like um, um, these, you have a way to label them basically. So I can say like, for example, these are my base provisioned entitlements. And over the period of time, I can monitor the drift that's happening on my entitlements. Now to monitor the drift, uh, all you need to do is go to the reports and you have the entitlement reports, I'll show you one of the sample. Uh, so for example, user account, if what, what if I want to know what has happened? What are the changes that has happened? Let me pick up the uh, older one, compare it to the latest one. And if you see the drift, it will give you a cool way to see what are the drifts that has happened. So if you see, there are some of the changes that has happened on these user accounts. And what are the changes? That's also there. So this is a cool way to know, like, you know, what has changed in my database over time. And this is, again, like one of the uh, things that you might want to closely monitor in your environment. Uh, so with that, um, let me turn that over to Nazir. Nazir, I'm 
through the studio cases. Let me stop my share. Thank you, Angeline, for covering that. Uh, before I start the slide, I'm going to launch poll. Like I mentioned, it has uh, five questions, multiple choice and single choice. Uh, that poll will be enabled for, for 30 seconds and request you to participate in that and give your feedback. Angeline has covered a, a part of the database auditing. Um, now let's discuss a little bit about uh, how you should planning your network-based um, uh, SQL monitoring, what you should uh, monitor and how you should monitor. Uh, database firewall piece in AVDF, that's a second part uh, DF, database firewall piece. Um, once any SQL comes, so before that, let's, un let's understand how, how that rule policy works a little bit at very higher level. Um, level. So once SQL traffic uh, comes to uh, database firewall or AV server, uh, you can define your, your policy can have multiple rules. So you can have your rule defined as a session context where, where you can define your, your actors or your actions would be uh, applicable on DB user, IP addresses, DB clients, OS user, etc. Okay, and you can take any firewall action, which is whether you want to pass, alert, block, or log, or escalate that particular action, okay? Uh, after session, you will have SQL statements where um, you can implement these policies based on known SQL uh, patterns. Uh, this will have uh, applicable actor or action will be your um, your cluster of SQL sets. So you can you can make okay these are the these are the known application SQLs for me and uh, and then you define your action okay i don't want to uh, log it or i want to make it pass but anything beyond that or or you know about that i is something i want to take action as block uh, the third rule you can define basis on database uh, objects which is like uh, like objects as well as um, uh, commands like uh, DML, D DCL, DDL, or, or other operational commands. So you can define which object and what sort of a command and uh, what action do you want to take. And finally, if anything doesn't fall under these three um, rules, it goes to your default rule, okay? That's more, we call it unknown SQL. So you haven't defined any rule or policy for the for, for such kind of a activity or such kind of a connection. And once you do that, um, what, what action do you want to take? Do you want to pass that block, that alert or whatever, okay? Logging or escalation. So this is how um, at high level uh, flow happens when network-based SQL traffic comes to the database firewall. Uh, from from the best practice suggestion perspective, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the very first thing what you should do once you implement database firewall is that you run your database firewall in log unique policy, uh, which is we call it as a training phase. So so during that phase. Uh, your database firewall is learning that what is the pattern? How do you connect to your application or how do you come through the client, et cetera? So once you have that data in your system for for good amount of time, maybe maybe two weeks or depending on how, how really accurate you want, so, so you can run it for, for a week or so or, or, or for a couple of weeks. Uh, once that data is there, you can start defining your policy or your rule, okay? We say that there are certain type of a traffic that you should pass, you should not monitor. So for example, once you define that, what is a trusted application path for, for you by session context rule, then you can pass those SQL traffic. The other option could be once you have defined that which SQL traffic from which trusted application, these are the known SQLs for you, then you can pass those statements. You should monitor the privilege user activities uh, in the combination, whether it is uh, uh, with the network, whether it is um, what SQL statements they are running or what object rules, like on which particular object they are modifying and uh, 
updating data or deleting and et cetera. So I will talk about all that. Um, actually, I have a demo for, for those use cases. So we'll, we'll show you that. Uh, you should definitely monitor your unknown SQL traffic. So anything which doesn't come in your SQL um, cluster cluster set, which you, you feel that it's, it's, a, it's a known uh, known SQLs for your application. If anything comes beyond that, you should definitely monitor that. You might not want to block in very first phase. Uh, you want to learn it that, yeah, definitely these kind of SQL, I don't want it to be running in the system. And then you decide to block them. Uh, at later stage, you can configure escalation based on limited, uh, um, sorry, repeated SQL pattern as well. So for example, you say that, okay, somebody if trying to, my DB is trying to access uh, uh, a data from database, um, thousand records being extracted. In first two instance, I will pass that because it might be uh, some requirement they are running, but if they are gonna do it third time in that particular session or something else, then I'm gonna block that. So you can escalate that as well. You, you can have escalation action. Um, so, so these are the high level best practices. I would say um, it's, it's good to start when you are implementing database firewall. Okay, so let's look at the very first uh, use case from the database firewall perspective and the third use case uh, from our overall, what we say that uh, uh, getting to X value out of your AVDF deployment, that let's create a trusted path to data. So like I said that, uh, first what we will do, we will create a profile, okay? I'll say that, so for example, Nausea is one user who comes from this particular uh, IP address, from this, um, her database username is this, and she comes from this IP, this client program. So this is a trusted profile for me, and I want to pass that. I don't want to monitor it, okay? And then you limiting my data access. You say that, okay, so this is the profile, and these are, if, if anything happened from these uh, cluster sets, then it's fine, but if if go if if user is trying to connect over and above these uh, trusted IP address or DB user set etc., then what you want you want to block such action. So let's look at uh, how you can define those policies. Um, if you look at here, just give me a moment. So uh, this is AVDF login page. I just want to make sure, yeah. Okay, so uh, we will go to policies. I will run you through with the policy. Okay, trusted path to application. Um, so very first thing what we have done or I have done in this particular policy that we have created test sets or profiles. So what I have done is that I have created, what you can do is that you can create a set of a group of IP addresses. You can um, either type them or import whatever is being accessed or you can, you know, from collected data, you can select it. So right now, my one set I have created, uh, which has only one IP address, uh, because currently I have one application which is running, a uh, web-based application, but it is running on my database server itself, okay? So, so the IP address of my application server is actually database server in my scenario. So that's why I have put this one particular IP address. Um, then I'm saying, this is a trusted user for me, okay? And then I'm saying, if this user is connecting from SQL plus and this user connecting from JDBC client. So which means this through this IP address, this particular user is connecting through two programs, which is my SQL plus and my second program is JDBC thin client, okay? then I have created two profiles. One is my DBA profile, where my DBA will connect through SQL plus. And second is my application profile, where my application user is, con is connected through or will connect through 
trusted client program, which is my JDBC connection. Now, if we go back, okay, and now I have defined one session context rule. Okay, we have set our profile, we have set our rule, two profiles are created based on different group sets. Now, my session context rule is says that if my IP address is part of or a group of inside this trusted IP address, and my database user is part of this trusted user, and my client program is part of trusted client program, then the action is passed, but I want to log always, okay? Once I have defined that, I want to do further one more rule where I will have a combination of database objects. The reason I'm doing that, I'm taking a trusted path uh, use case in a way that if my users are connecting through JDBC client, or which is my application server IP address and JDBC client, then this is a trusted path to me, okay? My second trusted path is if my DBA is connecting to the database directly, but what I want my DBA, he should be able to select, but should not be able to update the data. So basically I'm saying there should not be a direct update to the data from SQL plus. Any updation should be done from JDBC client. And in that scenario, I am saying you block that action. Okay, so now any, any object, if, if they are trying this particular DBA profile, I have, cre I have selected DBA profile. So DBA profile has that IP address, DB user and client program, which is SQL plus. And I'm saying DB DML connections, and I want to block that action. If anything, which doesn't fall in that, uh, that scenario, it goes to the default rule and I am blocking. Okay, if anything beyond and above that, I am blocking. If, if user is trying to do something else, I'm just blocking that particular action, okay? So I will go back to the target and let's deploy this particular policy because right now this policy has not been deployed. So I will go, I will select that particular policy, okay? Once I have selected this policy, first let's go to the application log into the application. Okay, I have logged into the application. I'm trying to search all the record. If let's say I want to modify one particular record, this particular user, I'm converting back as active user, I'm able to do that, okay? Now let's go back to our SQL plus. Okay. I will connect to, I will connect through that trusted user through the proxy the system I have created. And now let's run commands which this particular user is allowed to do that. Like a select command, okay. Uh, we have said, so I'm able to do any select request on this particular system. Okay, now let's run update. So I'm trying to update that particular, that same table from direct SQL plus, and it is not allowing me to do that. Okay, so that's how you create the trusted path to your application. You can modify, you can go very innovative, you can define multiple conditions to it. Now let's look at second use case, which is detect data exfiltration. That means if somebody is trying to access more than data what they are supposed to access, then we will define that policy, okay? We will capture return rows. We will select object in which object I want to monitor return rows. And then I will define alerts so that I, it, it can get alerted, okay? Now let's go back to the AVDF console. I will show you the policy, what I have defined. Okay. 
Okay. Here we did not uh, created any profile or set. If you want, you can even uh, restrict by user profile or or, or select uh, define certain sets. We have created database object rule. What this database object rule is is saying. So you see there is no uh, profile attached to this particular rule. We are saying um, select and DML capture number of return rows, and you can have uh, this for any table or select a table. So now I have selected few tables. I'm saying I want to monitor that, capture it, but you log always, but pass this action, okay? But anything after that is what I want. I don't want to block it, but I want to get alerted. What you can do is that you can define your threshold also. So you are saying that if, if within this time, if data exfiltration happening more than two times, then you want to block it. You don't want to block in, um, in first go. So you can even define that. Um, now let's go back and Okay, we will deploy this particular policy. Right now in this scenario, I have created different policies uh, with different rules. You can have single policy with all these rules club. It's just that you need to look for how, how your data is flowing. So you logically, it should be right and you should be able to club all the rules together. Okay, so I'm going to select my uh, PI exfiltration policy that I have uh, uh, mentioned. If uh, and and we said that uh, we want to capture such kind of a record. So if you go here, you can go and uh, run, for example, queries uh, which are going to select many records. For example, this one selected, uh, you know, four fifteen. Other one. Other one will select some thousand records, et cetera. Here on the database firewall report, you can come, you can, uh, you can select a row count. By default, row count uh, might not be coming. You can select row count. You can select other columns, whichever you want. And let's say I want to create a filter and I'm saying uh, where my row count is greater than and equal to 100. Okay, so it is showing me those records that which uh, those queries which I have run uh, here in database firewall. Other thing what I said that you create an alert policy. So if you go to the policy, I have also defined uh, alert policy to get notified, you can integrate with emails also. So here I'm saying row count is greater than 100. You can choose whatever number you want. And target objects are like this. Uh, so we selected certain objects, a similar thing we are defining here. You can define object name. So you are just uh, make it simple uh, and with the wild card um, characters. And you can uh, configure your email notification that can be, those alerts can be distributed, um, captured and distributed. So if you come on the alert reporting, you will see that um, there are data exfiltration reports are coming here. Um, you can close those depending on, you know, uh, if, if you review it and you want to close it, you can close them. If, if, if you want to go into uh, further investigation, you can go and do further investigation. You can look at the complete detail, what data being captured, what the you know, activities being done, et cetera. Okay, so those alerts will be generated through alert policy and it will be available in the, in the alerts. Now our third use case, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, prevent SQL injection. So first thing what we will do, we will train engine, we will create the, uh, the, the cluster set of allowed SQLs. Uh, 
you can see that there are there are uh, unique capabilities that AVDF provides that um, how many times those SQL are running, when first time it ran, when last time it's running, etc. So those details you can see that uh, you know, when we capture it, they are captured with the mask values, those SQL, so you cannot see the value. Uh, that's the unique capability what AVDF provides. And finally, you can assign those allowed SQLs to the uh, to the profile. So let's quickly go through that. This is the last use case and we are just, uh, we have some time left. Um, so this is the policy uh, I have defined. First thing what I have done is that I have defined the cluster set. So if you click on this, you can actually look at which all SQL you want to add in your um, list, okay? There are added one here. You can go, you can say that, uh, you know, uh, all rows to be displayed. And then for example, something like where you say that select a star from, okay? Which, which gives you a lot of uh, data exposure. You don't want to make these SQLs as part of your allowed SQL cluster set. So you do not select such kind of a queries and you select only the query, which you know that is, these are coming from your application, et cetera. Okay, so once you define this particular SQL set and you can keep on adding more SQL to your SQL sets, okay? It's not like a one-time job. You can, if your application changes, if anything changes, you can keep on adding SQLs to your SQL sets. And once you define your SQL set, you come here, you define your, uh, your rule. You say that uh, allow SQLs, you can uh, select your, uh, which SQL set, uh, for example, I have created that HR SQL set and you say that pass, and I don't want to log such, of, no, such SQLs, but anything if, which doesn't fall as a, as, a, as, a, as a approved SQL, then I want to block uh, such kind of a SQL running on my application. So for example, uh, I have this Java application and uh, like I said, so, so we have enabled the debug mode also. So for example, uh, the famous single quote union select a statement, uh, like a standard SQL injection uh, queries, let's try to run. So this particular application is, is vulnerable, is prone to SQL injection. Um, so if I pass any query, if you look at this particular query, you observe there is a union, single quote to this particular query uh, with the generic query which is running on the application and it exposes the data like uh, routing number and uh, social security number and all sensitive uh, account number etc all sensitive information okay this is happening because my policy this particular policy which we were talking about here it's not been deployed yet okay so if i go back and uh, deploy this particular policy. Okay. And now let's say I go back here and again, I'm trying to run this particular query running in deep mode. There is no data being written because uh, remember my substitute query was uh, where one is equal to two. So no record being written. Uh, the same query ran, but no record being written. So, so these are top use cases, which you can implement. We wanted to show you so that you can get maximum out of your AVDF uh, investment uh, deployment, what you have done. So with the key values like complete 360 degree coverage with the, uh, not only database auditing, but network monitoring, um, relying on the actual SQL statements as you have seen, not like a regular expression. So that means reducing near zero false positive not only capturing database auditing or database network activity monitoring, but beyond that, like operating system, directory service, and anything, any source which provides audit that you can integrate with, uh, with AVDF, with very rich reporting analytics and alerting, uh, 
and complying with the, your global as well as local regulatory compliance, uh, you can achieve differentiated security with Oracle Audit Vault and Database Firewall. Um, so these are the high level use cases what we wanted to cover. Hope this session was useful to you. Uh, after this session, we will send you out uh, this presentation for your reference perspective. Uh, we will also send along with um, this presentation, we will send you a post event survey and uh, there would be some useful, uh, some questions which can help us to enhance our solution that how you are using and where do you feel that uh, uh, you want us to focus. Um, it will have few questions regarding that. And definitely we would like to know um, that which is that uh, next topic you want us to cover. As I said, that AVDF cafe um, opening is today it, in a, and it was very first session in that series and it's gonna be quarterly series. And every quarter we will come up with the new topic with exciting topic and tell you something new about AVDF so that you can get maximum out of your, um, your investment in AVDF. And, uh, and if you are a partner, you, you learn and you, you help customers to achieve what they want to achieve. Um, so, so we will have that post survey sent, uh, request you all to please fill up and send back to us so that uh, it is useful for us and useful for you. And thank you for, uh, so much for giving us time today. And it was great um, talking to you all through, through poll and from q and I would say that many questions and I hope it was um, really helpful. Thank you.